to the uh, numerical analysis for Galerkin uh, 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 reduced order models. Uh, today is a, is, is a real pleasure to introduce Professor Volker Jan from uh, Lias, a Bayeshras Institute in Berlin. Um, so Volker has been doing, um, uh, he's, a, he's an expert in, in uh, finite element methods for Navier Stokes. He has a well-known book. He wrote a well-known book about that. Um, and, and also reduced order modeling um, is both computations and numerical analysis. And um, Volker is a friend and it gives me great pleasure to have him uh, I'll give you this talk on SUPG, stabilized POD ROM uh, method for convection diffusion reaction problems. Volker, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Taya, and thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk to this audience in this seminar. So the um, title of my talk was already announced, and this will be or is joint work with Baptiste Moreau from my group at VIA and with Julia, uh, she is also attending this, this talk, Julia Novo from Madrid. But actually, um, I will speak about the title, the topic of the talk only in the second part of the talk. In the first part, I will speak uh, about a different direction in the research concerning convection diffusion reaction problems. And this is then joint work with Gabriel Bernetschea from Glasgow and Peter Knobloch from Prague. So let's uh, continue convection diffusion reaction equations. I'm sure you all know uh, this kind of equations is just to fix notations more or less. What you see here is the evolutionary equation where we have here the te temporal derivative on the left hand side. We have the diffusion term, the convection term and the reaction term. Some boundary conditions, some initial condition, and we consider always a domain in two or three dimensions. Yeah, it's here a linear initial boundary value problem. And you all know that such equations are used to model conservation laws. So for instance, if one considers the conservation of energy, then U is the temperature, or one models also the conservation of concentrations. Okay. We have this, this problem. This is a solution of a steady state benchmark problem. So uh, in the previous slide, I showed you the evolutionary problem. But in the first part of the talk, I will also speak a lot about the steady state problem. And as I said, this is a typical solution. This is a benchmark problem uh, proposed by uh, Tom Hughes and co-workers in the 1980s. You see um, uh, here, the uh, convection field has is of order one, and you see the solution is more or less piecewise constant, but it has a typical feature, which is very, very important. These are here the boundary layers that you can see here in front and on the right. And here, what is not so easily to be seen, it's the interior layer which comes from the convection of, let's say, a discontinuous boundary condition through the domain. Yeah, this equation uh, or this solution comes out if the diffusion is very small. So I think this was for epsilon 10 to the minus six or 10 to the minus eight. But this is a usual case in application. So I have experience with chemical engineers and in uh, these equations, there were always the difference between the orders of magnitude between diffusion and uh, convection was something like uh, six orders, yeah. And um, one can do some asymptotic analysis and then one can see that the boundary layers are of size epsilon roughly and the inner layer of size square root of epsilon. And so for small epsilon, uh, they cannot be resolved in two dimensions and three dimensions. And this makes the problem complicated for numerical simulations, because it turns out that this uh, linear boundary value problem is in a numerics, a multi-scale problem. Yeah, we have the large scales, which are the piecewise constant parts, there's no problem, but there are subgrid scales that cannot be resolved and that are the 
typical and important features of the solution, which are the layers. And it is well known in general that an accurate and physically consistent numerical simulation of multi-scale problems is a challenging task. Okay, what does it mean now for convection diffusion reaction equations to be accurate and to be physically consistent? To be accurate uh, uh, in finite element methods, so I will restrict here to finite elements, um, there one considers usually the order of convergence in some norms. And uh, so it is uh, well known that uh, many methods that were proposed for the convection dominated regime where uh, the diffusion is much smaller compared with the uh, convection. And these schemes are then called stabilized methods. That many of these classical stabilized methods have this property of being accurate in the sense, yeah. So, for instance, the uh, SUPG streamline up in Petrovka Lurkin uh, scheme uh, that will be the part uh, that will be the topic of the second part of the talk, but also other uh, classical stabilized. Methods like Galoquin D squares, continuous interior penalty, uh, local projection stabilizations. However, if one applies these accurate schemes, so uh, one has higher order of conversions for higher order of finite elements and appropriate norms, then one can see that all these methods lead to non physical values, to so called spurious oscillations, in particular in a vicinity of layers. And uh, there already starting in the 1980s, and a lot of nonlinear extensions has been proposed that have the goal to reduce or best to remove these uh, spurious oscillations. So we call them salt schemes, so spurious oscillation that layers diminishing schemes. So this is accuracy as one can find it in the context of finite element methods for convection diffusion reaction equations. But there was a second desire, physical consistency. And physical consistency in this context can be phrased as the, satisf as the satisfaction of uh, the discrete maximum principles. Yeah, that means one has no spurious oscillations. I already told you that the classical stabilized methods do uh, show spurious oscillations, so they do not satisfy discrete maximum principles. And it turns out that also almost all of these, let's say, classical salt schemes that were proposed in the 1980s and 1990s, there are dozens of schemes of this time, the type, they do not satisfy DMPs. Yeah, and so um, the construction and the analysis of accurate and physically consistent methods is a current topic of research. And uh, I'm working in this topic and uh, together with Peter Knobloch and Gabriel Barinecea, we uh, composed a recent review of this topic uh, for finite elements. It uh, covers both the steady state and the time dependent problem. You can find it here on archive and it will appear probably at the end of the year in SIAM review. And in the first part of my talk, I like to say a few words about yeah, what is the contents of this review or what are the results? I will start with the steady state problem. So we just have a linear boundary value problem. And then it seems to be natural that one uses a discretization where at the end one has to solve one linear system of equations. Yeah, so we call it linear uh, uh, discretization, linear finite element method. I always will consider uh, the uh, convection dominated regime. Uh, so that means uh, convection is much larger than diffusion. And there are linear uh, finite element methods that satisfy discrete maximum principles. The first idea or the first way to achieve this is to add sufficiently or sufficient linear isotropic artificial diffusion and to use P1 finite elements. This was already observed in, at the end of the 1970s in a paper by Kikuchi. Yeah, and then one has usually assumptions uh, on the grid. So for this approach, one has to assume that the grid should be uh, acute. Then there is a 
class of linear methods, uh, linear up in schemes that can be applied to P1 finite elements when there's also a scheme for the Crucera finite element, where one can prove that uh, the discrete maximum principles are satisfied. Um, these schemes were proposed also at the end of the 1970s or beginning of the 1980s. So for the Crucera finite element, one has to be more um, careful in the description of the result because there the DMP is satisfied with respect of the degrees of freedom. So only for the values, so for this element, it means only for the values in the Bari centers of the facets, there one can prove that the DMP is satisfied, not for the complete finite element function, yeah, only for these selected values or for these special values. Such a result might be a problem uh, in coupled problems because in coupled problems, the solution of one equation of the problem is usually a data of uh, an input data for some other equation. And if for the other equation, one applies finite elements, one has to assemble the matrices in the right hand sides, usually achieved by quadrature rules. And the nodes of the quadrature rules are usually not uh, located at the locations of the degrees of freedom. So that means in the quadrature points, there might be unphysical values, although one has this DMP with respect to the degrees of freedom. Okay, so the first two. Uh, Methods are really old methods, 50 years, or not, not 50, 40 years. The, the last uh, linear DMP satisfying finite element method is, is not that old, but it's also all is from the last century. It's the edge average finite element scheme of Xu and Sikatano from 1999, again for P1 finite elements. However, one has to say here the discrete maximum principle can be proved only in a special situations. For instance, if the convection field is constant. In general, one can, one can only prove the positivity preservation, which is less than the discrete maximum principle. Yeah, the DMP is a two-sided bound, whereas a positivity preservation is just a one-sided bound from, from below. You see in all these, um, methods that I emphasize P1 finite elements. However, the restriction of the DMP property of uh, linear discretizations to P1 finite element occurs already for the Poisson problem. So this, this is not a difficulty that comes from convection dominance. It, it's already for the Poisson problem. If you have a close look at the Poisson problem, you will find it also here in this survey. We also discussed the Poisson problem. You can see that uh, for P1 finite elements, I think everything is known, it's clear. There are a few results for Q1 finite elements. There is more or less one result for P1, for P2 finite elements in two dimensions. And for P3 finite elements in uh, two dimensions, one can already show that uh, it's not possible to satisfy discrete maximum principles. As we shall see then in the numerical example, if one applies this linear discretizations and for convection dominated problems, one gets usually quite inaccurate numerical solutions. So if there are linear uh, methods, there are also nonlinear methods, yeah? nonlinear DMP satisfying, satisfying finite element methods. Uh, of it, in the first glance, it seems to be an overkill to use a nonlinear discretization for solving a linear boundary value problem. But in the convection dominated regime, it's the natural approach, in my opinion, because of the multi scale character of the solution. Yeah, in order to get really good solutions and physically consistent solutions, one has to do different things for the large scales and for the subgrid scales. Yeah, and uh, the subgrid scales, uh, yeah, the position of these uh, scales depend on on the problem, they depend on the numerical solution. And the solution is not known, and so it, the discretization becomes naturally nonlinear. So again, uh, one can there are discretizations, so one can prove uh, discrete maximum principles again, usually with assumptions on the grid, which I will not go into detail here. You will find everything in the review paper and. Everything I'm going to say here is for P1 finite elements. 
So, there is a classical nonlinear method, a nonlinear absinthe method proposed by Mitsukami and used already in the 1980s, but then improved by Petr Knobloch in 2006 and also in some further papers. There is a method that was published by Eric Wurman and Alexander Ern in 2005 in a quite famous paper in Matcomp here. And we call it, or it's not only one method, there are more methods, we call it Buman urn methods, and they are based on some nonlinear extension on a continuous interior penalty method. Yeah, one adds some nonlinear term, and then um, one can prove if some user chosen parameter in the nonlinear term is sufficiently large, then the discrete maximum principles are satisfied. And then there is another extension of a, a classical method of a LPS, local projection stabilization method by a nonlinear term. And this was proposed quite recently uh, in 2017 by, by Gabriel, Eric, and Karakalzani. And again, uh, they added some nonlinear term with some user chosen parameter. And if this parameter is sufficiently large, then one can prove the discrete maximum principle. However, in the context of nonlinear discretizations, there are a completely new class of methods arises, so-called algebraically stabilized scheme, schemes. Yeah, the first scheme of this kind for the steady state problem was proposed in, only in 2007 by Dimitri Kuzmin in some five-page conference proceeding. Yeah? And I think about the steady state cases, maybe just one or one and a half pages. Yeah, and then in um, 2010, uh, Peter, Gabriel, and myself, we met in uh, Berlin, so we discussed on, on what we could do together. And then we had the idea uh, first to understand what happens in, in, in the scheme. So at those time, we even did not understand what happens. We just know it worked well. And um, then to do some numerical analysis. And then it took us five years to get the first results and to publish them in 2015. And then I think a kind of um, yeah, breakthrough for us was this paper in 2016. Yeah, for the Kuzmin scheme, we could prove, we have the first convergence proof. We, we could prove, of course, the discrete maximum principle. Here, we had some restrictions on the grid. Uh, we uh, could prove the existence of the solution of the nonlinear problem. So uh, uniqueness is open. Uh, but we could prove uh, if one applies a certain kind of iteration for solving the nonlinear problem, we could uh, prove that the linear problem in each step of this iteration has a unique solution. Yeah, and then we continued this topic. And meanwhile, uh, we also could uh, propose algebraically stabilized schemes that satisfy the DMP or DMPs on arbitrary simplicial grids. And here I should add for elliptic boundary value problem. So these are, you can also use them as nonlinear discretization for the Poisson problem for n isotropic diffusion and so on. And you will get solutions that satisfy the DM discrete maximum principles. Yeah, the first of these schemes is the uh, an algebraic flux correction scheme, AFC method with, v, it's called BJK limiter from 2017. And then uh, quite recently last year together with Petter, we uh, could uh, propose or we could improve the Kuzmin scheme. That's uh, actually, it's an improvement of the Kuzmin scheme. Uh, uh, and we call it monotone upwind type algebraically stabilized MUAS method. Okay, here, some uh, uh, numerical example, of course, uh, yeah, we like to see what happens or what are doing all these uh, stabilizations uh, where one can prove the discrete maximum principle with, let's say, the steepness of the layers. So we, uh, we um, prescribe this profile here at the inlet boundary, which is the bottom boundary here. Then we had a circular convection. Cylon 10 to the minus five, we have here at the outlet boundary, we have a reference profile that we could compute with a very, very fine grid. And we have some reference values. And then we compared uh, what are the methods are doing. 
In those uh, computations in the survey paper, we had just one linear discretization, which is a linear upwind scheme by Baba and Tabata. And you see this is the black line, which is much, much away from all the other lines. So it's much less accurate. It's very inaccurate. So the other lines for all the nonlinear schemes are closer together of or through one can see here on course grids there are quite differences. Yeah, these are mostly these are AFC schemes with Kuzmin limiter, BJK limiter. Here we had some BBK limiter. It's a, a different uh, limiter, also proposed by uh, Burman, Barnechea, and Karakatsani. Yeah, you see there are differences, uh, and uh, it seems to be here, or it is in this case, that the pink curve is the most accurate one, the AFC scheme with BJK limiter. However, I have to say this is just one uh, side of the metal because one has to keep in mind one has to solve nonlinear problems. And the efficiency of solving these nonlinear non -linear problems is also a very important aspect. And for the AFC method with the BJK limiter, we have the experience that it's often quite hard to solve the nonlinear problem. It needs a lot of iterations, or even we were not able to, to meet the, our uh, tolerance with this. So this is much simpler if one uses different limiters. Okay. Uh, if you are more interested in the numerical behavior of these uh, schemes, uh, including uh, there is an another paper, which you can see here. And in these uh, more comprehensive studies, there is all the edge method by Xu and Sikatanov included, and also an F AFC scheme with so-called monolithic limiter, which was recently proposed by Dimitri Kuzmin. Uh, just one slide for the time-dependent problem. Of course, there are linear discretizations, linear upwind schemes. So if you have a look in uh, these um, original papers with the upwind schemes, you will find they were all proposed for the evolutionary uh, problem. Yeah, they're just a backward Euler scheme, no, even a forward Euler scheme uh, as temporal discretization, used mass lumping, and then introduced these upwind schemes. They can be used. Uh, they satisfy the DMP, but they are very inaccurate. So we have some paper with Julia about 10 years ago where we use these schemes and they are really, really uh, inaccurate. And of course, there are also nonlinear schemes, but not that many. And, um, and there is, I think, more or less only this class of FAM flux corrected transport schemes. This um, the idea of flux corrected transport schemes goes also back to the 1970s. So in one dimension for finite differences and finite volumes, and then a breakthrough was in I think in 1986 or seven by uh, from multiple dimensions. The breakthrough was with the uh, Salazar limiter, and there were also some ideas in order to uh, yeah, apply these ideas to finite elements, but. The person who um, systematically extended these schemes to finite elements then was Dimitri Kuzmin, starting at the be beginning of the century in 2002 and uh, 2006. Yeah, and there are many, many further contributions by Dimitri. And these are also uh, belong to the class of algebraically stabilized methods. And then, as I said, in 2007, he published this idea for the steady state problem based on all these ideas for the time dependent problem. And then uh, we continue to investigate this idea for the steady state problem. For the time dependent problem, it's quite interesting. And as you will also find in uh, detail here in this survey, the uh, FEM flux related transport scheme or one has to solve a nonlinear problem. And the uh, iteration for solving this problem is designed in such a way that one can prove the DMP for every iterate. But that means from the point of view of DMP of discrete maximum principles, it's not necessary to perform many iterations. And based on this observation and some other modifications, there is a linear variant of this FEM flux directed transport scheme. And um, in my applications from chemical engineering, I use this 
linear FEM flux corrected transport scheme. And I think this is a very good compromise between accuracy. It's much more accurate than, than the linear upwind scheme and efficiency because one has to solve in each step only one linear system of equations. Okay, now I will move to uh, the topic of my talk and uh, this uh, one keyword in this topic is UPG is SUPG. So I think you all know the SUPG finite element method and I just uh, like to say only a few words. Yeah, it's a classical stabilized uh, discretization introduced by Hughes and Brooks in around 1980. It adds artificial diffusion in streamline direction and the stabilization term uh, looks like this. So you have a sum over the mesh cells, some stabilization parameter, the residual of the strong form of the equation, and then as a test function, the streamline derivative of the test function. And here, this is the inner part, L2 inner product in the mesh cell K, as I said, residual based. Okay, for the steady state problem, I think more or less everything is known. It's very well understood. It's probably, at least in academics, I think it's the most popular stabilized method. And already in a PhD thesis by Navar in 1982, uh, there was the convergence proof, one can prove uh, convergence of higher order in a in an appropriate norm, it's called SUPG norm. So this norm has some contributions from the stabilization, a higher order for higher order finite elements. But as I already said, there are still quite strong, notable spurious oscillations in vicinity of layers. So for the time dependent problem, so we like to do uh, ROM, so we consider the time dependent problem, it's much more complicated. To the best of my knowledge, uh, the first comprehensive numerical analysis uh, of this, this stabilization for the time dependent problem is in a paper of Julia Novo and myself in 2011. It's our first joint paper. And um, one aspect that we consider in this paper, it's the so called continuous in time SUPG method, where we uh, didn't apply a discussion in time, yeah, you will see still here the continuous time derivative. Then the method looks like this. So you see that the orange terms are just the residual of the strong form of the equation. And you see the pink term is just the streamlined derivative of the test function. Yeah, so this is the method. If one equips all coefficients with physical units, then one can find that the stabilization parameter is a time scale. Yeah, delta k is a time scale with a unit, for instance, seconds. And then at the beginning of our yeah, uh, yeah, of our efforts to uh, do the numerical analysis, we use uh, let's say some uh, standard uh, approaches, and then we found out in the analysis, in the numerical analysis, that the stabilization parameter should be proportional to the length of the time step. But we discussed then in this paper that is not appropriate. Yeah, so because the multi-scale character of the solution is with respect to space, yeah, the uh, uh, subgrid scales are the, the layers, they are with respect to space, not to time. Yeah, and if one would apply some, let's say some standard grid and a temp temporal discretization with a very small time step, then there is almost no stabilization left. If the stabilization parameter is proportional to the length of the time step, and then one can, can see a lot of spurious oscillations. And then one of the goals of this paper in, from 2011 was to uh, define the stabilization parameter, which has to be a time scale, but in, to define it in terms of the mesh width in space. Yeah, and this works, as I will present in the next slide. So actually, uh, in this 2011 paper, there you can find the analysis for the continuous in time case, the backward Euler method in the crank nicholson scheme. And I think the, the most important one is the continuous in time case in this paper, because in the continuous in time case, there is no time step. So the stabilization parameter cannot be depend on the length of the time step. And if I remember well, in the initial submission, we just had the first case, and then we were asked by the referees to add also the other cases, and uh, we just did it. But um, yeah, 
there are some assumptions and in particular the first assumption is quite restrictive and not nice in the numerical analysis because we had to assume that the steady state convection and reaction fields do not depend on time yeah they might be depend on space this is fine but not on time and i will come back later to this point to explain it then we uh, considered only the convection dominated regime I, okay that i think this is the interesting regime it's fine we had to assume a uniform mesh and the same stabilization parameter for all mesh cells yeah at this uh, initial let's say presentation of the results in 2011 we uh, did not care on uh, the physical units in the stabilization parameter and it, it looks there a little bit different than here but uh, together with uh, bosco garcia achilla from uh, from uh, sevilla and julia we uh, published two years ago also a survey paper on robust discretization robust with respect to convection for time dependent problems so for time dependent convection diffusion equation which is just a small part of the survey, in, in particular for time-dependent incompressible Navier-Stokes equations, which is the big part of the survey. And so there it covers in particular turbulent flows. And in this survey, uh, one of our goals was to uh, write to present everything with uh, consistent physical units, and there you will find also this parameter. And this is a time scale, yeah. So, for instance, H is the mesh width, which uh, has the physical unit meters. Uh, this is a constant from an inverse inequality without physical units, and this is the infinity norm of the velocity or convection field, which has the physical unit meter per second. Yeah, and you have meter divided by meter per second altogether. This is a time scale here, second. This is a constant, and you can see that all, or one can check that all the other things are also constants with respect to the physical unit. So the first term is a time scale. And here, for instance, this term, the, the physical unit of the reaction field is one over a second. So that means the Allen infinity norm is one over a second. So altogether, this is also a time scale, and also this is a time scale which one can check. Okay, and this will be our stabilization parameter. And then uh, we could prove uh, error estimates. And here you will find uh, some uh, one result. It's for the continuous in time SUPG method. Yeah, we got an estimate in uh, the L2 norm at, the, at some time, at the final time, or the considered time, uh, the L2 norm in, in, in time, and the SUPG norm in space. And the first term here is just uh, the approximation of the initial condition and uh, derived quantities of the initial condition, but all of them can be controlled uh, by doing it uh, sufficiently uh, exactly. And then you see here that we have the uh, optimal order of conversions h to the power r plus one half for finite elements of order of, of degree r. So we have optimal order of conversions. It's an accurate method. A basic step of the proof is that uh, we um, apply the error estimate in the SUB genome for an auxiliary steady state problem. As I said, for the steady state problem, everything is known and then we could just apply it. But uh, compared with the steady state problem, the only more or less additional term is this term here with the temporal derivative in the stabilization. And this term makes the trouble and we have had also to apply here some estimate, of course. And in order to do this, um, yeah, we differentiated the uh, the problem with respect. To, uh, uh, sorry, the problem with respect to time. Uh, and then, in order to get an equation for the temporal derivative, and in order to get an equation of the same convection diffusion reaction type as before, there we had to assume that the convection field and direction coefficient are do not depend on time. Okay, that's uh, what's known for the finite element method. Now I like to come to the uh, ROM method, PUD ROM method. As I already said at the beginning, this is joint work with Julia and uh, my colleague from the Weierstrass Institute, uh, Baptist Moro. So in this paper published last year, we had uh, the, the goal of uh, doing a finite element error analysis in different norms to get 
this was important, the robust error bounds. So robust means here that the constants do not blow up if the diffusion goes to zero. Yeah, I think this is the usual meaning. And we could also discuss an approach for a posteriori error estimation. You all know the process, the process of PUD ROM, and you know that first one has to apply some full order method, which I now use the abbreviation form, but it's just the finite element method that we used in this 2011 paper. And of course, we like to use the results that we had in this paper and for the analysis we had to use and the assumptions that we had in this paper. For the analysis, we use the backward Euler method for simplicity and the stabilization parameter based on the mesh within space that I presented at the previous slide. Okay, now we have the finite element simulation. The next step is uh, to uh, collect the snapshots. Uh, for the analysis, we took it in each time instant, and then uh, the, the space that is spanned consists of capital N equals 2m plus 1 vectors, where m is the number of time steps. Yeah, so it consists, uh, this, uh, this uh, set of vectors consists of the solutions in every time step. There we have m plus 1, so including the initial condition. And then also of, of, of approximations of the temporal derivatives of the form solution, yeah, which looks like this is just some backward uh, finite difference. Of course, it's clear that the uh, generating elements of V are linearly dependent because here the approximations of the temporal derivative are just linear combinations of the form solutions. However, um, then in the next step, if one applies the uh, PUD, it makes a difference. Yeah, one gets a different, uh, uh, a different distribution of the eigenvalues if one applies, uh, if one has included this approximations of the temporal derivatives or not. And with the different uh, distribution of the eigenvalues, one gets also different ROM bases, as you will also see then in the numerical studies. Why did we consider this more complicated approach also to include these approximations of the temporal derivatives of the form solution? Uh, this is based on observation. This was made by uh, Gurgul, uh, Samuela, Trajan, and co workers recently that these approximations are needed for getting L infinity L2 estimates. So that means uh, pointwise estimates in time. Okay. Now we apply the PUD and get the ROM basis and can do the uh, ROM simulations with the SUPG stabilization. So we use the standard SUPG formulation as I showed you before and the backward Euler scheme for simplicity for the analysis at least. How to choose the stabilization parameter? There's an older paper of Trajan, myself, and two former PhD students where we already asked this question. And uh, yeah, in this older paper, we studied two approaches, one approach based on uh, some PUD uh, idea and the other approach uh, just to choose the same stabilization parameter as for the finite element method. And based on some, let's say, initial analysis and uh, above all based on numerical simulations, we came to the conclusion we one should choose the stabilization parameter in the same way as in the corresponding uh, finite element method or in the form and full order method. And now that this paper uh, published last year can be considered to be an analytic support of this older paper. Yeah, the error analysis. As I said, uh, we like to use the results that we had in the 2011 paper, and therefore we had to assume the things that we assumed there, so uniform grid, steady state coefficients. In addition, we assume for simplicity that the divergence of the convection field is zero. We consider the convection dominated regime. And then uh, the analysis was based on the decomposition of the error in, in this form. Yeah, I think the first decomposition to uh, uh, include here the form solution is quite natural. Yeah, here for the uh, first term, we have the difference of the uh, solution of the continuous initial value boundary problem. 
and here we have defined element solution and that we could use the results from the 2011 paper based on all these assumptions. But then uh, it, there was a second decomposition where we inserted here the projection of the finite element solution of the form solution into the ROM space. Here in the second term can be estimated by using properties of the projection operator, which is not so difficult. And then uh, yeah, we had to spend the work in estimating here this pink term at the end. Yeah, But it turned out that we could use essentially the same tools uh, that we used in this 2011 paper in order to get the estimates. I will not go into details. I just like to show the result. Uh, we got a priori estimates of this form. Here we have an, the L2 error in space, a discrete L2 error in time. And you, you see it here, it's the square of the error. And then you see here, we have some constant that is independent of diffusion. So we have a robust estimate. Here we have the optimal order in space. Here the optimal order in time. So I said backward Euler. Here, this is the tail of the eigenvalues from the PUD. Here, and he, um, then we have here the approximation of the initial condition. And the last term is a product, again, of the tail of the eigenvalue, so it can be made small. And all these things here, uh, these uh, contributions are coefficients of the problem, epsilon, epsilon B, capital T, C. And here we have this stiffness matrix for the PUD basis, the uh, spectral norm, and this can be also computed. So uh, as I said, another goal was to get an estimate point-wise in, in, in time. Here we have a discrete L infinity estimate of the L2 norm and it's more or less the same structure of the error bound. And then we also have an error estimate where we have the SUPG norm in space and discrete L2 in time. So these are the a priori estimates. I already uh, mentioned the back uh, the, the key word a posteriori error estimation. Um, for a posteriori error estimation, one can use a decomposition of this type where we just inserted here the find element deform solution. For the first term, there are robust estimators in some norms that can be found in the literature, for instance, in this paper, uh, joint work with uh, Javier de Frutos, uh, Bosco Garcia, Achilla, and Julia. Um, and one in the pre-processing step while uh, simulating the form, one can compute these error estimates yeah, uh, based, for instance, on this paper. And for the second term, it turned out that uh, in uh, the error analysis, um, there we get an estimate of this term uh, by by this term here, and this is the term which already occurred in the error bound. And I said, this term is computable. So it's just data of the problem. It's computable even offline. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, this is just uh, data of the problem and um, contributions that come from the PUD, like the tail of the eigenvalues and this uh, spectral norm of uh, this uh, stiffness matrix. And there's a similar approach possible for LN, L2, and SUPG. Now I will present some numerical studies at the end of my talk. We use a traveling wave problem. Here you see the data of the problem, epsilon very small compared with uh, convection. Yeah, This is the initial condition. And this is the solution at the final time t equals to one computed with the SUPG method. You see here that there are some small uh, undershoots. The good thing is for this problem, we have a prescribed solution. We, so we can compute errors, but you also see that the uh, diffusion parameter appears in the solution. So, um, <clears throat> of course, we liked to support the analytic results. And to this end, we like to choose the SUPG parameter according to the analysis. If you are doing this, we get for P1 finite elements a small constant times the mesh width. And this constant is much smaller than usually used uh, in, in practice. Uh, we applied this approach, but we could observe large sugar oscillations in the solution. So they were re really, really bad. But at the same time, one can observe that replacing delta by a constant times delta where 
the constant is uh, positive and fixed, has no impact on the analysis. And so we applied the constant 100 and then we used the delta of this form, which is uh, more or less proportional to the mesh width. We applied exactly the same approach for the P2 finite element that we got this delta. Maybe you can remember that then uh, the constant of an inverse in a quality appears uh, in, in the definition of delta and this constant is different for P1 and P2. Then temporal discretization. In order to support the analysis, we use the backward Euler scheme, but also we use the BDF2 scheme. But in both cases, we or in all cases, we choose a time step that small that the temporal error is negligible. Yeah, it's, it's really not of interest, the temporal error. It's the first order for the Euler, second order for BDF2. So it's negligible. Storage of the snapshots. Again, there were a set of uh, studies where we supported the analysis. So we took it every time instant for P1, but for P2, we, uh, uh, we used a more practical approach where we used every 10th time instant. And then for the computation of the PUT basis, uh, we used standard weight. That means using only the snapshots, but of course we also used the way that we analyzed where we included in addition to the snapshots, the approximations of the temporal derivative. Some representative results here for P1 finite elements. On the left hand side, you see the results only with snapshots, so the standard approach of PUD, and here with snapshots and temporal derivatives. The red curve is the error of the ROM solution, and you see that you reach the, let's say, the plateau where it's equal to the FOM error for the approach only with snapshots at around, let's say, uh, 60. Uh, basis functions for the PUD rank 60, whereas one needs 130 uh, if one uses the snapshots and the temporal derivatives. Here one can see these oscillations, which are not nice, I think. Um, then you can also see some information on the R posteriori error estimate, which is the black line. Here the, back, the black line is below the blue line on the right picture. You can see it has the same form as the error here and here, but there are some overestimation here by a factor of maybe 20, something like this. And here the overestimation is even more, maybe a factor of 100. And the blue line is just the second contribution of the a posteriori errors being made. And you can see that the second contribution, where I go back maybe, where you have here the tail of the eigenvalues, that this second contribution becomes uh, eventually small. Here for uh, about 100, uh, rank 100 for using only the snapshots, but here it's not yet to be seen for using the snapshots and the temporal derivatives. Okay, here uh, we studied some components of the PUD. Uh, again, left uh, with only the snapshots and right with the snapshots and the temporal derivatives. We had a look at the uh, spectral norm of the stiffness matrix of the ROM basis. We found it's uh, the sizes uh, on the grids that we considered of several hundred. So it's becoming larger for um, finer grids, which is it's clear. But we also observed that the order of magnitude here is the same that was recently observed by Julia and Samuela in their paper on uh, navier Stokes equation. So I think that this is fine. And we had here, you can also see the uh, decrease of the eigenvalues. And you see here, you have to have to note that this goes up to 600 and 600 is here in the right picture. One can see that if one uses only the snapshots, the decrease is much better than uh, compared with using the snapshots in the temporal derivatives. The final result is a P2 result. It's some, uh, solution at the final time. Again, left with only the snapshots and right with the snapshots and the temporal derivative. Using only the snapshots there with 30 uh, basis functions in the PUD, there are still quite a lot of oscillations and uh, yeah, one can see them. For 130, one has almost a perfect solution. There are still some uh, small undershoots over here. In order to get, get similar results for the approach with the snapshots and the temporal derivatives. 
Yeah, one needs much more basis functions, 500 and 600. So with this, I like to summarize my talk. In the first part, I spoke on a recent developments on numerical methods for convection diffusion reaction problems with the emphasis on methods that satisfy discrete maximum principles. There are still surprisingly few finite element discretizations that have this property. And uh, I think it's clear, meanwhile, that uh, to get accurate and DMP satisfying results, it's only possible with nonlinear discretizations. And many of these nonlinear DMP satisfying schemes are proposed rather recently in the last decade. So there was a big progress in this directions. But there are still many open questions, also, or in particular, with respect to the numerical analysis, and in particular for the time dependent problem. So for the time dependent problem, one can prove for the FEM FTT scheme the DMP. This is by construction. Or we could prove the existence of a solution and existence and uniqueness for sufficiently small time steps. But uh, there is, for instance, no error analysis so far. And uh, there are open questions in the efficient solution of the nonlinear problems. I think this refers more to the steady state problems. We, we did some research in this direction and we have some results, but I think there is still space of, uh, for improvement. And in the second part of the talk, I spoke about QD-ROM for convection diffusion reaction problems. I presented the error analysis or more precisely the results of this analysis for SUPG stabilized QD-ROM. And the analysis required to include approximations of the temporal derivative. And, but the numerical results showed that uh, if one uses QD-ROM without these approximations, then the results are usually much better but the analysis is open. And another point where it's uh, important point where the analysis is open is uh, the, uh, the approach that one stores the snapshots, not every uh, time instead, but only every M time step where M is larger than one. Yeah, and with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Walter. Thank you for a very nice talk. This is uh, this was a great. This that's what we had in mind when we started uh, this, this seminar, like uh, you know, balance between numerical analysis and computation. So thank you. And I also like the connection between finite element form and and the and POD the use of the modeling. I think that this is uh, something that is not usually discussed, but that was great. Anyway, so any questions for Volker uh, from the audience? You can unmute yourself and ask questions, raise your hand if you prefer. Um, so I cannot see any raised hands. Uh, so, so maybe I'll start with a question. So I, I really like this summary at the end, towards the end. And um, I was just wondering, so it looks to me that, and it's natural, uh, the finite element level, the numerical analysis. So there are open questions, but the analysis is quite well established. And I, you know, if you look at the POD level, there is numerical analysis, but there is not at the same level. Yes. So I was what right. So I was wondering what. <laughs> so what what do you think are you know like open questions? Um, things to be investigated, important numerical analysis or even computational questions that need to be addressed at the POD level to bring POD maybe to a similar level as finite element. Mm. Yes. Um, even for finite elements, I think uh, there are many open important questions. So I, uh, in some sense, emphasize the restrictive assumptions that, that we have for the SUPG method. This, this is open. Uh, and um, so for the POD, yeah, so yeah. Uh, I already stated some open questions here. Um, I have to say this, um, I'm working in this field, but I'm, um, I'm not really in depth familiar with the current results. And maybe these are open questions that are also uh, applied to other equations. 
a posteriori, so um, I, we had some idea here, uh, yeah, but uh, a real a posteriori analysis is also open, I think. Uh, yeah. But uh, I have the impression, and this is uh, also, uh, I think this is also one intention or one reason why this seminar uh, uh, takes place, that at the moment there is a, a lot of efforts to uh, to improve the POD analysis. And I'm I'm sure, so I, I don't, I'm sure I know that in some weeks, if Julia gives her talk, you will also see a lot uh, of uh, more analysis than for the Navier-Stokes equations. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for uh, Volker? Might I ask one? Yes, of yes. course. Hi, thanks for the for the presentation. I have a curiosity in uh, connecting the first part and the third part. So the uh, the part uh, the first in the first part uh, uh, you introduced some of these nonlinear schemes for uh, for uh, related to the discrete maximum principle, and then in the final part of the of the talk uh, you uh, you discussed uh, POD ROMs. So, as you know, uh, nonlinear problems uh, in ROMs come with their own set of challenges. Uh, for instance, uh, one would need to use hyperreduction techniques uh, to uh, to achieve the, the the online performance. Um, to which extent, uh, if if you were to if you were to try and adapt uh, those uh, nonlinear uh, techniques to a ROM, would you be would you be willing to adopt uh, these nonlinear schemes? Uh, the answer is uh, yes, I would willing to do it because I think the physical consistency of the solution is in for applications uh, that the methods are accepted by pr uh, practitioners, it's, it's of utmost importance. So that's why I would willing to uh, adopt this, but I have to say, I have no idea on how to do this. So far, it's uh, so. Uh, if you okay. have a look at these non-nonlinear uh, uh, non techniques, they are also they are always very local. They work really with the local basis functions, yeah. When you don't have them in the room, so uh, yes, this is is also an open question. Uh, um, maybe I I can say uh, say that uh, we we did the first step so. Uh, we already saw these spurious oscillations in ROM simulations a while ago, together with the former, my former PhD student Svetlana Gire. And with Svetlana, we already tried to do a, to improve it somewhat. At least the initial condition is not uh, is not um, polluted by spurious oscillations, and there we applied some techniques that we know from. Uh, uh, from uh, turbulence flow simulations, we applied some filtering techniques to uh, to remove at least the oscillations from the uh, initial condition. Yeah, this, this is at least a, is a small, a tiny step in order to to reduce at least the um, unphysical values. But to uh, get something, uh, some DMP satisfying ROM, I, I have no idea how to do it at the moment. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Volker? Oh, I, 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 have, I have one, maybe one, one other question. So Volker, so how, um, how much of this, of this uh, numerical analysis and um, uh, you know, insight can be expanded to, let's say something like the Navier-Stokes equations? Um, so in the Navier-Stokes equation, physical consistency is something different. This is in this equation that, uh, for the incompressible Navier-Stokes equation, that the solution is uh, weakly divergence-free. You need different techniques, and maybe I don't know whether Julia will uh, uh, speak about this, uh, but there is, uh, you, there I, maybe I go back, there is, no, 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 no. 
Um, uh, just a moment. No, here. Yeah, I have to remember because I didn't speak about this. In this uh, review paper, there you can find the state of the art from 2020 around. Uh, so there are methods that uh, have uh, that uh, where you get uh, divergence free solutions. This is possible. They are also robust uh, with respect to convection. So it, um, the physical consistency can be extended also to higher order finite elements in this case. So, it, uh, so there is not a restriction to first order elements. Uh, the POD ROM analysis of the incompressible navy, oh, it's my cuckoo stock yet uh, now. Uh, so the physical, uh, the um, POD ROM analysis of the incompressible navy Stokes equations can be also extended uh, to the uh, PUD-ROM, so there is the paper of Julia and uh, Samuela, uh, as I am sure Julia uh, will speak about this. There is also a recent uh, accepted work by Bosco, Julia and myself. So there, uh, as in some sense, I would say for the navier stokes equation, it's even more than for convection diffusion equations. <laughs> okay, okay, very nice. Thank you, all right. Well, any any other questions for 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 Volker? Um, so I'm sure that Volker is going to be okay. If you have any other questions, you can uh, you can maybe send an email uh, directly. Yes, of Volker. course. You are welcome to uh, contact me. No problem. And uh, and uh, uh, if no more questions, then um, let's thank uh, Volker again for a wonderful talk. Thank you, Volker, and see you next time no, at the uh, next uh, Nagam seminar. Thank you.